You're sitting in a courtroom, not as a spectator, as the defendant. The prosecutor stands up, holds up a DNA report, and says with absolute confidence, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the DNA found at the crime scene matches the defendant. The lab confirms this profile occurs in only 1 in 10,000 people. That means there's only a 0.01% chance, one hundredth of 1%, that this defendant is innocent. The jury nods. The numbers sound damning. Mathematical, scientific, certain. But here's what the prosecutor just did. They lied to you with math. Not an intentional lie, maybe, but a lie nonetheless. And if you don't understand what just happened, you could spend the next 20 years in prison for something you didn't do. This isn't a hypothetical. This exact scenario has played out in courtrooms hundreds of times. It has a name, the prosecutor's fallacy, and it sent innocent people to prison. But before I show you how to defend yourself against this mathematical trick, let me tell you about the case that started it all. A case so absurd, so mathematically incompetent, that the California Supreme Court warned that bad math could become a veritable sorcerer to ruin law. It all began on an ordinary day in Los Angeles, 1964. An elderly woman named Juanita Brooks is walking down an alleyway when someone shoves her to the ground. She looks up to see a blonde woman running away with her purse. At the end of the alley, a man named John Bass witnesses a white blonde woman with a ponytail get into a yellow car. He sees the driver is a black man with a beard and a mustache. These sound like basic facts, eyewitness testimony, the kind of stuff that happens in criminal cases every day. But Prosecutor Ray Senator decided to turn these facts into numbers. And that's where everything went wrong. The police found an interracial couple, Janet and Malcolm Collins, who matched some of these descriptions. They'd only been married for two weeks. Now they were being arrested for robbery. But here's the problem. When Juanita Brooks and John Bass were asked to identify Janet and Malcolm from photos, neither one could do it. Juanita completely blanked. Bass only saw a resemblance in the ponytail. The prosecution had almost no case. So, Senator got creative. He brought in a math professor from Cal State Long Beach to testify about something called the product rule. The product rule is simple. If events are independent, you can multiply their probabilities together to find the chance they all happen at once. For example, if thing A has a 1 in 5 chance of happening and thing B has a 1 in 10 chance of happening, then both happening together is 1 in 50. The professor explained this to the jury. Then he left the witness stand, and that's when Senator started literally making up numbers. He invented six probability estimates based on the descriptions. A black man having a beard, one in 10. A man having a mustache, one in four. A white woman with blonde hair, one in three. A woman with a ponytail, one in 10. An interracial couple in a car, one in a thousand. The car being yellow, one in 10. He gave the professor a pencil and paper. The professor multiplied all six numbers together using the product rule. The answer, one in 12 million. And that was it. The professor left. The damage was done. Senator stood before the jury and explained that this mathematical proof was actually better than the concept of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Why? Because it dealt with hard numbers instead of vague beliefs. He called it the new math. He said it would help convict the people who push old ladies down and take their money. He told the jury that Malcolm and Janet Collins were the only two people in Los Angeles who could satisfy all these probability elements. They have to be the one in 12 million, he said. How could they not be? The jury convicted them of second-degree robbery. Janet and Malcolm Collins, two newlyweds who couldn't even be identified from photos, were going to prison because of made-up math. Malcolm Collins appealed. The case went to the California Supreme Court, and they absolutely obliterated senators' stupidity. First, the obvious problem. The numbers were completely made up. Did Senator analyze vehicle registrations to determine that 10% of California's cars were yellow? Did he survey hairdressers to find out what percentage of women wore ponytails? He just guessed. Second problem. These events are not independent. You can't just multiply the probability of a beard times the probability of a mustache like they're separate coin flips. Beards and mustaches tend to come as a pair. A lot. The product rule only works when events are independent. Senator ignored this completely. But here's the big one. The one that matters for understanding the prosecutor's fallacy. Let's say the math was accurate. Let's say you really did find a couple who satisfied all the conditions to be 1 in 12 million. Great. How do you know they are the couple who committed the crime? Are Malcolm and Janet Collins the only blonde ponytail, black-bearded and mustached couple with a yellow car in the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area? Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. 
the Supreme Court actually calculated the probability that another couple fitting the same description existed in L.A., over 40%. Even if all the math checked out, which it didn't, there was pretty close to even odds that the Collinses were the wrong couple. This is the prosecutor's fallacy in its purest form. Senator confused two completely different questions. Question 1. What's the probability of finding someone who matches this description by random chance? Answer. 1 in 12 million, allegedly. Question 2. What's the probability that this specific couple committed the crime, given that they match the description? Answer. We have no idea because we don't know how many other couples also match. In math terms, Senator calculated P given description if random couple. But what the jury needed was P given guilty if matching description. These are not the same thing. Three years later, Malcolm's conviction was overturned. Janet had already served her short sentence. The Collinses never really got justice, but their case changed everything. Or so we thought. Because 35 years later, halfway across the world, the same mistake would destroy another innocent person's life. England, 1999. Sally Clark's two infant sons died suddenly, months apart. Tragic. Devastating. No clear explanation. At her trial, a pediatrician testified that the chance of two children in one family dying of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, was 1 in 73 million. The prosecutor used the same logic. Ladies and gentlemen, the odds of this happening naturally are 1 in 73 million. The odds of murder? Much higher. Sally Clark was convicted. She spent three years in prison before statisticians got the case reviewed. Because here's what everyone missed. That one in 73 million number was the answer to the wrong question. The pediatrician calculated P, given two SIDS deaths. If innocent parent, what's the probability of two SIDS deaths if the parent is innocent? But what the jury needed to know was, P, given innocent parent, if two sudden deaths, what's the probability the parent is innocent given that two deaths occurred? To answer that question, you need to know. What else could cause two sudden deaths? Could be SIDS. Could be undetected genetic conditions. Could be environmental factors. Could be murder. When statisticians did the proper analysis, considering all possible causes and the fact that in families where one side's death occurs, the probability of a second is much higher than in the general population, the numbers told a completely different story. The one in 73 million was meaningless. Sally Clark's conviction was overturned but she struggled with alcoholism from the trauma. She died in 2007, never fully recovering from what the justice system did to her. Now let's go back to your courtroom, where you're sitting in the defendant's chair, listening to that prosecutor tell the jury about your DNA match. You're on trial. DNA evidence matches you. The profile occurs in 1 in 10,000 people. The prosecutor says, 1 in 10,000 means 99.99% chance of guilt. Let's do the actual math. You live in a city of 1 million people. If this DNA profile occurs in 1 in 10,000 people, how many people in your city match? 1 million divided by 10,000 equals 100 people. 100 people in your city have this exact DNA profile. You're one of them. So what's the probability you're guilty based solely on this DNA match? 1 in 100. That's a 99% chance you're innocent. Not a 99.99% chance you're guilty. The prosecutor just pulled a Ray Senator. They confused P given evidence if innocent equals 1 in 10,000, the rarity of the profile, with P given innocent if evidence equals 1 in 100, accounting for how many people match. It's like saying, the probability of being a billionaire if you're named Jeff Bezos is pretty high. Therefore, if you meet someone named Jeff Bezos, they're probably a billionaire. Obviously wrong when stated that way, right? There are thousands of Jeff Bezoses. Most aren't billionaires. But in a courtroom, with lab coats and official reports and scientific-sounding numbers, this error slides right past people. So how do you fight back? Let me give you the exact words you need to say. When they say 1 in 10,000 match, you immediately respond. Your Honor, I'd like to clarify the statistical evidence. The prosecution states this DNA profile occurs in 1 in 10,000 people. In a city of 1 million, that means approximately 100 people share this profile. This is not a 1 in 10,000 chance of innocence. It's a 1 in 100 chance of guilt from this evidence alone. The prosecution has confused the rarity of the evidence with the probability of guilt. Make the jury understand. You're not the only match. And remember Ray Senator making up those numbers about yellow cars and ponytails? You can use that against any prosecutor who tries the same trick. Your Honor, I request the prosecution provide documentation for these probability estimates. 
Were vehicle registration records analyzed? Was a proper statistical survey conducted? Or are these numbers speculation? If they can't produce receipts for their math, the math gets thrown out. Here's another weapon from the Collins case. Remember how beards and mustaches aren't actually independent? If a prosecutor is multiplying probabilities together, you ask, Your Honor, the prosecution is using the product rule, which requires these events to be statistically independent. I request they demonstrate that these characteristics are truly independent events. The Collins case gave us something even more powerful, a legal standard you can invoke by name. After Malcolm Collins' conviction was overturned, courts established what's now called the Collins test, four conditions that probability evidence must satisfy. First, the probability factors must be accurate. You can't just make them up like Senator did. Second, the calculations must be done correctly, no abusing the product rule, no ignoring independence requirements. Third, all factors must actually apply to the parties involved, not just vague generalities. Fourth, the evidence must prove there could be only one result. You must demonstrate the defendant is the only person who could satisfy these conditions. When a prosecutor presents probability evidence, you can literally say these words, Your Honor, I request this probability evidence be evaluated under the Collins test established by the California Supreme Court in People v. Collins. Does it satisfy all four conditions? If not, it should be excluded as unreliable. Now, there's actually a formula that solves all of this. It's called Bayes' theorem, and it's the mathematical tool that correctly converts P-given evidence if innocent into P given innocent if evidence. It accounts for how rare the evidence is, how large the population is, what the prior probability was before the evidence, and alternative explanations. Some jurisdictions now require expert witnesses to use Bayesian methods when presenting statistical evidence, but most don't, which means you need to know this. Because somewhere, right now, there's another prosecutor preparing to tell another jury that some rare piece of evidence means their defendant is virtually certain to be guilty. Maybe that defendant will know enough math to fight back. Maybe they won't. Justice shouldn't require a statistics degree. But until that changes, you better know your math. Because the difference between freedom and prison might just be understanding the difference between P given A if B and P given B if A. Two arrangements of the same letters. Two completely different meanings. One could save your life. And if this video might save someone you know, share it. Hit that like button. Subscribe. Because the next time you're on a jury, or in a courtroom, or just reading a news article about DNA evidence, you'll see this fallacy everywhere, and you'll know exactly what to do about it.